indicator species. Let's talk about it. Well, it turns out there are certain species of organisms uh, who can alert us to the, or, or in, inform us of the health of an ecosystem uh, based on their presence or absence. We sometimes call these things bioindicators, but basically we can count these organisms and use them as a way of determining the relative health of an ecosystem. So their increase or decrease tells us something about the, uh, the availability of food, the amount of toxins, uh, just basically how our ecosystem is doing. Often, uh, ones that inform us by their absence are ones that are have a very narrow tolerance range and ones that inform us by their presence have a very large tolerance range. So it's, it's related to our last topic that we studied. So let's start with a few examples. Lichens. Lichens are a symbiotic relationship that exists between algae, which is photosynthetic, and fungus, which is not. <clears throat> it's a consumer. They, they live together. They make this thing called lichen. And you've seen it. You may not have realized what you were looking at. Uh, now, there's different types of lichens, and some of them are more tolerant of certain uh, chemicals in the environment than others. And a particular pollutant that they are sensitive to is sulfur dioxide, which happens to be a fairly common pollutant from uh, car and uh, basically the burning of fossil fuels. <clears throat> so bushy lichens like the ones we see here, uh, these tend to be uh, in, indicative of very clean air. They have a very narrow range of tolerance, the slightly high elevated uh, levels of SO2 and they're gone. The leafy ones, to, I'm not sure what that little circle is, the leafy ones tend to tolerate some uh, uh, but not as, but, 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 but they're less, they're more tolerant than, than the, than the uh, bushy. And then we have the crusty lichens, which you see on rocks all the time. And these ones are pretty tolerant of SO2 in the atmosphere. So if we see, uh, an, uh, an environment where we see a lot of this and a little bit of this and none of this, we can use it as a way of saying, you know, I think there's a problem with the atmospheric pollution in this environment. If all I see is this here, I'm like, yeah, it's pretty significant. So it's just one way of indicating the relative health of the ecosystem. Now, uh, these things can be anything from apex predators like a bald eagle down to uh, E. coli bacteria to often their little uh, uh, small insect larva. Anything we can use that can give us insight into the health of an ecosystem as a bioindicator or an indicator species. Let's start with E. coli bacteria. E. coli bacteria is uh, present in the intestines of many mammal species, including yourself. And so if we find, if we just sample water from, say, the Tanchon River, and we notice that it's got E. coli in it, usually in order for that to happen, there must be some effluent flowing into the river that's carrying raw sewage, because otherwise, where is this bacteria coming from? So it's informing us of an uh, uh, increased level of pollutants simply because it is something that is associated with the digestive tracts of mammals, we shouldn't be finding in the river, in, in, at least in the levels that we find it in. Uh, wood storks in Florida have been, have been used as a way of monitoring the health of it. So basically, sometimes what happens is we can lay out a plan for how we're going to remediate uh, an ecosystem that has been harmed. Oh, you know what? We've, like in the case of the Everglades, uh, we have this wetland population of wood storks. And they really they they need to have a certain uh, level of water and the all the uh, food web associated with this level of water. And when people started diverting water in order to build uh, houses and, and shopping malls, whatever, the first thing they noticed was a, a dramatic drop off in the population of wood storks. So wood storks served as an indicator species for the overall health of this one food web in this wetland biome. What they found is they implemented uh, measures to try to remediate, and the way they were able to tell if it was working was they looked for a resurgence in the population of the wood storks. Algae in streams is an indicator species. So algae, normally most streams should not have a layer of green algae covering the rocks. Uh, algae is present, but usually in small quantities. When you start seeing enough of it to notice, that means there's probably too much uh, in the way of nutrients in the stream. So there's too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus getting into the stream. Usually that means that uh, there are human impacts occurring. So in a normal nutrient cycling of an ecosystem, there's usually not going to be enough of that present in a stream to allow these, these large algal growths to occur. So when we see that, that tells us uh, there's being an impact here, that we're, we're, we're definitely 
putting too much nutrient into the stream by human action. <clears throat> River otters are an apex predator. They may not look like it, but in their environment, they are an apex predator. Uh, and they are like pescatarians, they eat fish. Uh, and basically, they are very susceptible to biomagnification being apex predators. So when you see a decline in uh, river otters, one of the first things you should think is, well, perhaps we have a problem with some sort of bioaccumulative toxin. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can then use that as a way of telling if your remediations are being successful by looking at the population of these otters. So that's how we use indicator species. Their presence or absence tells us if there's a problem and it tells us if our remediations are being successful. Now, you can use them as a, an actual quantity quantitative method. So uh, one way is in streams, there are, is usually a certain uh, population that is fairly common at a genus level uh, in streams, and they have different levels of uh, ecological tolerances, uh, let's say to dissolved oxygen. So what we find is from things that are very low, uh, like stonefly nymphs have very low tolerances for changes in, in O2 levels. And then you have things like tube effects worms, which they don't really care. I mean, they, they can live in just the most harsh environments. So what we find then is that, that be it DO or, or toxins, a lot of these is an indication of an unhealthy, if, if there's a preponderance of this, it, it means it's an unhealthy uh, water system. And if there is an abundance of these, it usually means that it's healthy. And so people have figured out a way of assigning a tolerance level to it. It's, it's a human construct, but it works. So basically, the higher the number, the more uh, the species is able to tolerate uh, ecological swings in dissolved oxygen, toxins, whatever. So we find like tube effects worms have a very high number because they're very tolerant of, of these uh, harsh conditions. Whereas this, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, metrotopodidae, I don't know, uh, has a very low tolerance. So it's given a very low number associated with it. And so what people have come up with is a biotic index. And basically the way this works is you're going to sum the following values and then divide it by the total number of individuals in your sample. So basically you take a collection uh, from a stream you design a way of, of getting a good uh, random sample. <clears throat> you find the number of individuals of each species like you would in using the Shannon Wiener index, except in this case, what you do is you're going to multiply that by its tolerance rating. All right. And then you're just going to sum up all of these. It's like a weighted average. Like it's, a, it's, it's a weighted average of the species times their uh, tolerance rating, and you divide it by the total number of individuals that you find, and it gives you a number. And the idea is if that number is big, you've got a problem. If it's small, you've got a healthy stream. So let's look how it would work, okay? So let's just say I collect uh, the following data. I've got 12 of these things I can't pronounce, and i got three of these uh, disudocidae and two tube effects worms, all right? Now I'm gonna calculate my biotic index. Now I'm looking at it, all right, I can tell you, it's probably gonna be pretty low because these have a, a low tolerance and these have a high tolerance. I have a lot of these, I have a small number of these. So what I would do is I would say 12 of these times their number, uh, three of these times their tolerance number, and two of these times their tolerance number divided by the total number that I've, I've collected, which is 17, and I get a, a, a a biotic index of, of 3.3, which is really good. So I, ha I can then look at this chart, and this chart says, well, anything below 3.75 tells me that I've got an excellent water quality, probably not much in the way of organic pollution. And when I start getting up these very high numbers, it tells me I've got a very severe organic pollution, like the, by organic pollution, uh, uh, we mean uh, that we have um, a lot of uh, organic solvents present. All right, so that's how we're going to use this, and we're going to do a, a, an activity where we try to apply this and see how it works. All right, thanks for watching.